Okay, so today we'll just talk about the file system. We're going to talk about this at a high level, and then when we go and talk about individual operating systems like Unix or Windows, we'll go into more detail about their system. But just at a high level, when you go and look at a file, sometimes whatever operating system you're using, you have uh, this information about the file, right? When, so what are some stuff that you'd see? Like, uh, date created, uh, last modified, permission. Uh, yeah, permission. Then, yeah, depending on the operating system, maybe what group, what group of users is allowed to use it. So, but that kind of falls under permission. Isn't it? So anyway, this ends up being called, this is information about the information. So this ends up being called metadata. So this is, and you know, the other stuff I have a list in the notes of all all the attributes of that file you have. So when you store the file out on a disk drive, this information has to be stored with it and updated as needed. And then what we want to do is we want to take the file and store it out on our disk drive. So a disk drive is usually a cylinder. Uh, it wasn't a cylinder, it was like a linear thing that would have to be a pretty big um, piece of tape or something like that. So generally it's, uh, for speed reasons, they, we always store things on cylinders. And then let's say, for example, I'll put a little green spindle in the middle of this. Suppose we had a disk that was divided up into tracks that we can store data on. And then maybe these tracks are so big that sometimes files are small enough that they couldn't fit on, that there'd be a lot of wasted space if you dedicated a whole track to it. So maybe what we'll do is we'll cut this, this up like a pizza. And cut each of the uh, slices up into what we'll call sectors. So what's in blue, these are called tracks. And then each of the tracks, for example, this right here, for example, we'll call this a sector on the track. So in this example, I kind of made this, let's say this is dead area in here. So this is a disk with three tracks. And each track has one, two, three, four, five, six seconds. Each track has six seconds. And in this particular example, there would be a total of eight. So it's six seconds per track. Okay, so when we go to take our file and save it out onto the disk drive, assuming the disk drive is broken up like this, and they pretty much are all broken up like this one way or the other. Somehow they circle the thing for speed reasons, and then we write along tracks. Okay, so if we wanted to take our data, we typed in some C++ code and then wanted to save it. This information is going to get saved with it. This will get packaged together with the file we're actually trying to save. And then we have to put it somewhere on the disk drive. Okay, so suppose we wanted to access a file on the disk drive. How long, this is a very generic question, how long will it take for us to get, assuming there's no other requests coming in from other processes, we're the only process going out to the disk drive and asking for our file. And let's say we had a read-write arm 
that was in some waiting position, like right here. And then we said, I want to get a file off of the disk drive and copy it into main memory. What would be involved in doing this? And how much time would the step take? So we would send a request. The operating system would send a request to the disk drive, and the disk drive, once mounted on the operating system, becomes part of the operating system. The company that made the disk drive gives the specs for how many tracks and how many sectors are on each track, so the operating system can deal with it. And now what does the operating system have to do? What's involved in getting the data? So first we have to find the beginning of the file, right? How, what would be involved or how long would that take? We would have to, the read write arm would have to move out to the track where the file begins, right? So that's going to take, let's say we wanted to model how long would this take. So the time, let's call it the seek time. Time to find the beginning of the uh, file would, would take how long? So first of all, when we send a message that says start looking, there'll be a little startup time. Or maybe we'll call it startup time. Just to get the disk drive running. Something to do with the property of the disk drive to get the motor started. Then, how far out would we have to go to find the the district, the uh, beginning of the uh, file. So the the number of tracks. Unfortunately, there's a lot of variables that would begin with a T here, with time and tracks. But let's say we'll call it n times n. So n will be the number of tracks. The number of tracks we'd have to scan across to get to the track where our file, where the first sector of our file is. And then M would be speed per track, how long it takes to move across each track. Right, something along that line. So, the, and that would be a property of the disk drive. How fast the read up right off this. So just to get to the beginning of the track, this would be how many tracks we had to travel across to get to where we're going. This is based on the speed of the disk drive, how long it takes to travel from one track to the next. And then maybe we'll just have a variable here to capture some kind of startup time. So, so this only happened once. Okay. Okay, so now suppose we have found the beginning of our file. How long would it take to read the file into memory? So maybe we could call this the transfer. Once we know, once we've now hit the beginning of the file, Let's say we found the, well, let's say we've done the seeking part, so we have found the beginning of the sector where our file starts. Now we want to start reading in the entire file. How long would that take? So if we wanted to model it, what variables would be involved? Right, the size of the file. Number of bytes we're transferring. Divided by, well, what we can say after that, the size of the file. We could say multiplied by how, how much time it takes to transfer a byte. But if we divided it by the number of bytes on a track, we'll call that big N. We'll call this, yeah, this will be the number of bytes on the track. Okay. 
Okay? And then what else will we have to add? Something to do with the speed of which it takes to travel a track. And if we did it as a rate, if we did it as a speed, it would go in the numerator. If we did it as a rate, it would go into the denominator. So we'll add a rate. So that would be half, like how many rotations per minute. Obviously, if we could make the rotations per minute go faster, that would make our transfer time go lower. So that's why it's showing up in the denominator. Okay. And then if we wanted to do an overall equation for how long it takes to get a file into memory, and we're making, it, we're making an assumption here, but it would end up being the total, trend, the total access time would be equal to the seed time plus the transfer time. And then also, if we were using, we'll get into some more details of how to lay out the files on a disk, but if we were using a, a method where we don't necessarily start files on a fresh sector, the file could start somewhere in the middle of the sector, and we'd have to take into account how long it would take to get to that starting point. The starting point would be on average one uh, in the middle of the sector. So we could, just for completeness, we could say one half times one over r. We'll put an r in the denominator. So that's how long it would take to get to the beginning of the file. So, actually, maybe I should have wrote that here because it's the second step. Yeah, let me do that. So it's. How long it takes us to find the, tr the sector where the file starts, plus get into the beginning of the file within that sector, plus now once we have the beginning of the file, we now have to start transferring, and that's going to be based on the size of the file, and how many bytes are on a track, and how, how long it takes to take data off of the track and bring it into memory. And that'll end up being the transfer. Okay, so that ends up being this plus this plus this part. Okay, now what assumptions are we making here? We're making an assumption that once we get to the beginning of the file, the file will be sequentially on the track. And if it went around the whole track, it would be, I guess, on the very next track. It would go from out of the inner to begin of the next track and go around. So we're assuming it's sequential. This would end up being the transfer time. But we were thinking, we were talking earlier, um, we were thinking it might be nice to have the flexibility that the file doesn't have to be contiguous in a row on the disk. There's advantages and disadvantages to that. And the obvious advantage to having it contiguous would make the transfer time a lot quicker. Right? Once you find the beginning, you just start transferring the data. If it's not contiguous, what would we then have to do? Right, so there's actually there's a couple ways we could do this. Um, so yeah, what, could, what are some ways we can do this one? We could say, um, so this is going to be on the topic of, yeah, laying out on the disk. If we wanted to have files on a disk,
And let's say our file, we decided what we wanted to do was to have our file go like this. Um, so we decided file one, part one is here, and file one, part two is here, and file one, part three is here. If we wanted to find, first we have to find the beginning of the file. We would find this sector, and now we would start, we would bring in one sector's worth of bits, but then somehow we'd have to know where's the next piece of this. And so what we're saying as a suggestion. So there's, obviously, there's a few different ways we can do this, and each method has its own name, but if you kind of just know tracks and sectors and then uh, and what we'll talk about is blocks in a second, on a per sector basis, which is I think what you were suggesting, right? At the end of the sector, you have to say where is the next sector. So maybe this is track zero, this is track zero, this is track one, and then this is sector zero. We'll always start with zero, we'll go zero, one. So this, would, this piece right here would be track one, sector one. So we'd have to record like a one and a one somewhere. We'll take up a little data to say where the next piece is. So the address is track one, sector one. Then this one would say its next piece is track zero, sector zero, one, two, three. So some, at the end here we'd say is we'd have a zero and a three somehow recording. Somehow we're recording the address by sector, where the next piece is. And then somewhere in here, maybe the file only takes up half a sector here, and this would now, so here, here's another just debatable topic. Would you want to, when a file ends, would you want the remainder of the sector to be wasted, or would you want some other file on the file system to be there? If that is the case, if you want to store the files on a per sector basis, you're going to have wasted space. If you allow files to share a sector, you'll use a you know, better use of your space, but now you get into the issue of you can't just bring in the whole sector and assume you're bringing in only part of your file. So there'd be an integrity thing if you started bringing in pieces of other people's files. So if that's the case, then you have to read out to the point where somewhere there have to be a marker to say, this, there's no more sectors, this is the end of the file. Instead of being able to just blindly bring in the whole sector. So again, there's always just trade-offs of how you want to lay these out. Okay, so now suppose, so the, this, if you were to give that a name, and I guess 25, 30 years ago they had like concrete names for these, but if you wanted to give this method a name, where you're doing it on a per sector basis, and then linking them together, what would you call it? Is the name, but you know it's going to be some name, something like that. <clears throat> now the other thing is suppose now so this is how it's laid out on the disk, but suppose from a virtual point of view, virtual is from always from the point of view of the person who created the file. They don't know it's going to be stored on a disk. They, I mean, they assume it's going to be stored on a disk, but, and it's the operating system's business, how it wants to do it. But from their point of view, they just start at zero and they go to wherever it ends. So let's say it went to uh, one FF. So this is their file. From their point of view, they don't, care, they don't know what's going on. They don't know what's being cut up and scattered around and pointers to sectors are going on. They just know when they eventually read it in, it has to be, in their mind, sequential. So their file, from their point of view, could have fixed length records to it or variable length records. It could be like a paragraph. It could be like a Word document. And each line has its, each line could have a fixed length. So maybe if you say hello, it might be hello, and maybe every line is 80 characters, whether you use them or not. So you might say hello and then have 75 blanks after it. Or you might say hello and then say that's the end of the record. You could put an end of record. 
So from the point of, from the virtual point of view, we're going to use the word records. That's if from the point of view of the file, does this person see a fixed size chunk of data and they just keep doing fixed size chunks over, or is it just random data? And from the point of view of the uh, user, is it sequential or not? Or non sequential? Now, most files we've used are sequential, right? If you create an executable or if you create a C or Java file, you have to keep that in a certain order. The order means something. You create an executable, you're creating a bunch of machine code. Those have to stay in order. But have you ever come across an, a file where it's made up of a set of records, but it's not sequential to you? You wouldn't care if the file came back with the records in different orders? So maybe something like a database, which is just saying I have a, a customer, a first name, a last name, use a password, and you just, as time's going on, you're adding new users to the database, but you don't really have a particular order to them. Then you might not care if this file is kept in order. Order doesn't mean anything to you. So, right, like, does that make sense that you could have a scenario? Most of the files, most of the files we use are sequential. Meaning, when this gets saved out on the disk, when I ask for it, it has to come back in the same order I give it to you. But sometimes, and this would be a big advantage, if your files are not sequential, all you care about is there's something that, from a virtual point of view, you consider a record. These, these fields have to be grouped together, but the records could be in any order. That could be a benefit to us if we don't have to worry about it being sequential. All we have to care about is that the records are together. So we can have files that are from a user point of view or from a virtual point of view, they're either sequential or they're not sequential. So there's a difference between files being contiguous on the disk and being sequential in the mind of the user. We could take a sequential file and put it on the disk, not contiguous, and use something like this sector-oriented linking mechanism. And the other thing is that the file on the disk, uh, I'm sorry, the file, the virtual file, could be something that does not need to be sequential. And then if we wanted to, we could put it on the disk contiguously or not. We have the option to this. So you can take um, so in the case where the from the virtual point of view, the um, file has records, but the records do not have to be sequential. If we could identify to the operating system that this is a non-sequential data set or file that, is, that ends up on IBM mainframe data, calling them data sets, because it's basically just a collection of data that's not ordered. Order. But if it was a non-sequential file, it's just a series of records. How can the operating system take advantage of this? Well, actually, yeah, let, let, me, let me just think of, uh, let's say we had an issue here. Suppose we did have a sequential file, and it was scattered across three sectors like this, or two and a half sectors. If somebody wanted to, let's say it was like a Word document, they wanted to load it into memory and add two sentences and then save it again, what would happen? Could we leave some of these sectors alone, or would we have to resave the whole data set, the whole uh, file?
pick up where, well, from, from the point where the change is made, from that point on, all sectors after that are going to be affected. So it might be better to just free up all these sectors and then resave it from scratch. But if it was something like a database that has, you just, maybe you've deleted a few records and added a few new records, you could leave what you have alone and you can go into the sector of the records you've deleted and just mark them instead of like making space and push, pushing the file back together, you can just mark them as being deleted. And then every once in a while you can go through and rewrite the, uh, the entire file, removing all the deleted records. And then anything new you can just add to the end because it's not a sequential file. Again, the order doesn't matter, so really where you edit them won't matter, and you can just start adding them to the end of the file, and if you run into a new sector, then uh, you just have to create a new link. Okay. So now, if we wanted to, if, if we're looking at it from the point of view of how long it takes to get the file into memory, What would be involved, and here I should have left this picture up, what would be involved time-wise if the file was, I yeah, think I should have left that up, if the file was scattered over different sectors? So yeah, let me write that back. So if the file was scattered over three sectors, what would now be involved in Getting like this sector, which then has a pointer to say this sector, which then has a pointer back to <coughs> the sector over here. If we just wanted to set up an equation for how much time it takes to bring this file in, what would be involved? We would have to go out to we'd have to go out to the track where the file starts. So that was whatever the equation we had before. There's some startup time and then how many tracks we went across. And then we find the first track. Now we start, we read in the first sector, but when we, if we chose to use the sector linked allocation of the file, when we got to the end of the sector, what would we do? Have to go look right, it's, it's, yeah, it's that whole, now the startup time was done once, but now the, how many tracks would we have to go across? And I'm doing a very simple example of two or three tracks, but imagine this was a disk with millions of tracks. How many tracks would we have to travel across until we get to the address we're going to? The address is track, and then within that track, we spin around to that sector. So we'd have to do that. That component of our time would be multiplied for every sector we have. So this is going to increase, this is going to dramatically increase the access time when we go out to the disk drive. It helps us a lot with space allocation but it hurts us on retrieval time. So if you have a file that for whatever reason your application retrieves a lot, this is a bad way to do it, having it scattered all over the place. If you have a file that gets updated a lot, and especially if it's a non-sequential file, gets updated a lot, this is a very easy way to update it. And if maybe once a day you bring the file and you take the hit on bringing it in. So really, again, it's a judgment call what's the best way to do this. So now suppose the operating system, there's more tracks. I'll put the thing in the middle here. Spin the lot. <clears throat> now suppose um, the operating system has many processes running at once and a number of requests are coming in at the same time. So this ends up kind of being like Think of it like an elevator in a building going up and down, and people on different floors are, are making a request. But if requests are coming into the disk drive for a file, how would you satisfy them? What are some, what would we call these? These would be called the algorithms for what we call seat time algorithms. So this is, once you get to the beginning of the file, now you're going to start bringing the file in. But 
for algorithms for minimizing the seek time from the time the request comes in to you find the beginning of the file. What are some choices that we can do? Suppose three or four requests come in for, from three different processes looking for a file. What are some who, who should we service first? Or what, what order should they be done in? Can obviously do first in, first service. Yeah, first. So that's not first in. Yeah, actually, I think it would be called first in, first out, but they call it. Um, <coughs> First come, first serve. Okay, so that would mean that if whatever request comes in first, the read write arm goes out and gets that file, depending on how it was allocated, determines how much time it takes. The next one that comes in gets service second. So the read write arm would, I guess, go back to the beginning and then start moving across the track and find the next. The next request. So that's kind of you know fair and um, that way there's no kind of starvation or anything like that. But suppose that's going to now do. Suppose the exaggerated example. Suppose you went all the way into the inner track to get a file. Then you move it all the way back, and then you have to go right back into the inner track again. Is there anything you can think of that might speed things up? Not sure. We call it the next address. Uh, the next, well, uh, next address in sequence or next something that says, okay, I'm here and this program wants something that's um, somewhere in the middle and there's three other requests. And on the three other, one of them is very, was the closest. Yeah, the closest, right. So, again, these names probably over decades have changed, but the shortest seat time first. So that's saying of all the ones that are in the queue, so now requests are queuing up. So different processes are asking for files. And they came in in a particular order. And we could do, um, you know, first, uh, a first come, first serve thing, which seems kind of fair, but we might be wasting time. It's kind of like an elevator goes up to the top floor and picks somebody up and then comes down to the bottom and then goes back up to the other top floor to pick somebody up. We might as well have picked some people up on floors that were nearby on the way down. Don't worry about who requested the elevator first. Kind of pick them up, who's ever nearby. So you're doing this for efficiency. So we could do this, but what's the down? So the, the upside is the amount of time spent going back and forth would be reduced on average. And what's the downside? What's the worst case scenario? Something could starve. Something could starve, right? So if someone's requesting something on the outer track, and the request just before them went out to like an inner track, and then a whole bunch of requests right nearby keep coming in, the one out here is going to be waiting forever. So any improvement on that one you could think of? Right, so goes to the center. You go right, so any request coming in, they call this one scan. You want to look it up on Google. And it doesn't stand for anything. You're scanning back and forth. So basically the needles, the read right arm is moving in one direction. And any requests that come in that are in the direction we're heading will service them when we get to them. And then once we get all the way to the inside, since we're already here, we might as well come back this way. And then some people argued that the, let's say the, the read write arm was here and the request came in for this track. This one has to wait to go all the way to the middle, then come all the way back. And it's servicing stuff along the way, so it's actually taking a lot of time. So then there was a circular scan, which basically says you start at the outside and you take all the requests going to the inside, then you bring the arm all the way back. So like you kind of go in a circle and then go inside again. This one takes a little bit more time because the time when the arm's coming back is not transferring any files. 
but it's a little bit more fair because something that's been waiting a while would get service quicker. Any other examples you can think of? This is still an open field of uh, research, creating disk drives to come up with faster methods for data retrieval. This is still a, a pretty wide open field. There's no other interesting one. Now, what would, how about the idea of having a number of read write arms? How can that help? So the disk is spinning, and a number of read write arms, each read write arm can handle a different request. And the disk it keeps spinning also to track scan or C scan at different intervals so that each one is at a different point on the disk at any given time. And Oh, yeah, you mean saying whichever one of these C algorithms we're using, they can both use the same one? Well, yeah, I guess what you could say is it's like having multiple elevators in a building. Right. And if you time them, you don't want the two elevators kind of moving together. You kind of like send one up, and then when one's halfway up, you send the next one up, and so on. So we could do that. Um, yeah, so multiple read-write arms could help. Yeah, and, and each read write arm would never be servicing the same file, but it would be, they'd be servicing different requests. Now suppose you got into a, uh, like a video server where you have a really huge file, and you need to re, you know, send it somewhere very, very quickly. <clears throat> so like we just, having multiple read write arms on one disk would help us have many requests for small files and satisfy those requests quickly. Now suppose we had a huge file and we wanted to be able to return the data as quickly as we can. So it's kind of like the multi, it's the, obviously the multiple rewrite heads, but now could we put the files on different disks or you know anything you can think of to put the files on different disks to make things, to make the, the rewrite time better for uh, retrieving one huge file. Well, so, okay, so the, if, if we put the file all on one disk, we're really stuck with the idea of having one read right head reading the sector to know where the next piece is. Or even if we knew where the next piece is, you have one, well, no, actually, if we knew where the next piece was, we could have a different read right on reading it. But one of the things that is a popular research field now, is um, R-A-I-D, which is redundant. So when you look at your disk drive, your overall disk drive of your entire computer system, um, the disk drive, if I wrote it out linearly, obviously it's a, a 
disk, or it could be multiple disks, but if we took the whole file system and wrote it out linearly, it might look something like this. And what we'd end up having is the, would start off, so this would be like zero, location number zero on your disk drive. So it would be the MDR, which is the master boot record. That's the instructions on the disk drive to get the operating system loaded. Then we would end up having a index of, this would be a partition table. And this is basically pointers to where our different partitions are. And we could have multiple operating systems on our disk drive. We could code up, we could have Windows and Linux on the same machine. And then we can just decide on the booty which one we want to run. So we could have partition one and partition two. so on. And then each end of, so this would end up being a pointer to this location. So this is an address of the, this location for partition two. And then partition two would be broken up into, so something like this would be broken up into, this is just magnifying it. Okay, this would be the boot block which we talked about before. So this is kind of what our disk drive would look like if we, were, if we wrote it out linearly. So this is what we said, the record that gets initially read starting at location zero that when your computer powers up. There'd be instructions in here to know which partition to use. We'd go to the partition that's being used and then jump out to that partition and then this would be booting up for the particular operating system we're using. And then everything pretty much after that is the space needed for the operating system to work with. And then this part, the files and directories, is the part we've been talking about tonight. All the different ways that we can store files and directories on our hard drive. So the thing I just don't want to get confused about is the way a file appears virtually is from the point of view or the mindset of the person who created it. How it is stored on the disk does not necessarily have to match the way the person wanted it. It could be cut up into pieces and that's unbeknownst to that person. From a memory point of view, when the operating system goes out to the disk drive to get the file, the disk drive has to know how it was organized and gather it for the operating system the way it wanted to. When it brings it into memory, that could be loaded in different sections, not mapping to what the disk drive had. And then when the file is used, it's used again from a virtual point of view. And what we talked about with the paging last time would be to know where the instructions, how to, how to map a virtual instruction back to a real instruction. So there's no direct map from disk drive to main memory, and there's no direct map from the virtual point of view, the mindset of the creator of the program, the file, to the disk drive, or to main memory. But these, do, these kind of get confusing because the concepts get repeated. Cutting the file up and then maintaining an index for where they are kind of ends up being the same thing. And as you can imagine, we can have a type of file allocation called an index file. And this would be exactly the same as 
it's, it's almost not worth covering, but there's a type of file called an indexed file. What you do is you have your records, you have, you have a series of indexes which point to sections on the disk drive where blocks are located. Exactly the same as our page table thing, where we took pages and put them into main memory and then had an index pointing where all the pieces are. So then if we wanted to go and grab this file, we would look at the first one and say, okay, the first piece is here, the second piece is here, the third piece is here, and then just go out and get all those pieces and grab them together. So a lot of the concepts of for virtual memory and allocating files on disk, the same idea applies. But they are different. So how the disk drive handles it and how the main memory handles it, the page sizes might not be the same. The disk could have a page size of 1K and then the virtual memory could have a page size of 4K. So when it goes out to get one page, it actually has to go and get what the disk drive thinks is four pages. Gather that together and bring it 